Good morning. Good morning. I am the Executive Director of the Brian Bible Institute. It's Brother David, uh, one of our board members and the uh, Associate Instructor. He's taught there many years off and on. And uh, we appreciated him. And his, and he came back. He took a sabbatical from teaching. He came back this year and taught at. And we're glad to have him. Uh, mind you're a good looking group. Best looking group I've faced this morning. Uh, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. And as we, we look at this, and I was, you know, how many of the different passages touch on the same subject that my passage, the sign passage, uh, touches on, the first seven cha uh, ch verses of chapter 5. Um, so I. You know, I didn't talk to Pastor Seekins that uh, he has the one that follows, I believe, and uh, uh, there's some overlap there. And so, I don't know. You know, we're instructed not to get on the other person's passage and do that. So, if I do that, first I'm going to call upon him for, for grace. And the other, if, if I do, when I, when I brought my attention, I'm chastised, I'll repent. Okay? So, <laughs> I... I, I actually carry a bag of uh, ashes and some sackcloth along <laughs> for that purpose. So. Now, it's hard not to touch on these because Pastor Fredrickson last night touched on so many of the same issues, putting off the old man and uh, what, what, what uh, this passage has in it. So let's look, look at these passages and we'll read them and then we'll take a look at what we see in them. Chapter 5, verse 1 of the feast. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and has given himself for us, an offering for a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. With fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you and become a saint. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not covenant, convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Starts out, walk in love, uh, or therefore be followers of God as dear children. You know, it's an interesting passage of Scripture. Be followers of God. We, you know, in, in the Grace Movement, we talk about following Paul. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And we talk about, uh, uh, and some carry that to an extreme and say that, you know, I've, I've heard this said, I've read it, that we don't follow Christ, that we follow Paul. That is not true. If you take Christ out of the equation, Paul didn't have any time. He said, you follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, you can see me as an earthbound example, but he was earthbound at that time, an example of one who followed Christ. And yes, we don't follow Christ in keeping the law, which he did, but the principles by which Christ lived are still valid. And if you don't think they are, just read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, where Paul calls us to be like-minded with Christ, which means to be thinking like Christ. To learn to think like Him. And Pastor Fredrickson was talking about that last night, wasn't he? Talking about renewed in our mind. And it's the Bible that, we, that, that renews us and through the Holy Spirit through the work of the Bible. It's interesting, isn't it? That two people can know what Scripture says and know it very well and it affects their lives so differently. Some that won't affect their life at all, except to demand that you, you read it and understand it like they do. Others, you'll see a change in their life. What's the difference? The same scripture. I think it's the openness to the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Another verse I can't go to. <laughs> Come to somebody else. Ye are therefore followers of God as dear children. I think this is one of the most, I think it's one of the most overlooked passages in Scripture. Paul's not saying come follow me. He's saying follow God. He's saying become an imitator. And the idea of imitation here, a follower, the word that's translated following, that talks about imitation, uh, it's not the, the a cheap imitation 
like our culture puts on to something that's, that's just an imitation or, a, uh, or mimicking something. No, it's not that. It's the idea of the standard that's already been set, something, and, and reproducing that and, and re, uh, uh, following that order of things. It's a positive command. That's what it is. Followers of God. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2 said. Let this mind be in you, which was Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, learn to think like Christ. Learn to think like Christ. That's what he's saying. Um, it's been many years ago, and then it took a resurgence a few years ago, a dozen years ago or more. Uh, what would Jesus do movement? And I, I heard people that were making fun of that. And but the principle behind that, some people, you know, like anything else, things can be misunderstood and abused. But the principle behind that, I think it was Stalker's Life of Christ that was written back in maybe late 1800s, early 1900s. But Stalker's Life of Christ, where that, where that came, came from, it was basically saying, how does Christ think? To learn to think like Christ is how it started out, what the purpose was. Be followers of God. Have you ever thought about that? Be followers of God as dear children. And give that serious consideration. We've really got this verse and see what's here. There's a lot here. I may have other verses to, go, to look at. Be followers of God as dear children. As children of God. You know... One of the things that, that, you know, when parents, and they're raising their children, they want to see their children walking in a certain way, don't they? And if they're godly parents, they want to see their children walking in the Lord. And emulating them, hopefully. And that's exactly what he said. We are children of God. You're a saint. You're a blood-bought saint. That's the only way you get to be a saint. You have to be redeemed by the blood. Then you're a child of God, and God wants us to follow Him. He is conforming us to the image of His Christ, of His own Son, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Come in the flesh. In Him, the low fullness of the God did bodily. You don't know what God would be like if He would be a human being. He'd be exactly like Jesus Christ. Because that's who He is. And He declares the Father. And I think of this, you know, I, one of the things I... I think for me, one of the scariest things about driving is driving in a parking lot or a big box store. I don't know what the rate of accidents there are there, but I see a young mother and she's taking her children out of the, of the vehicle. And they're at different levels. And so she has three children, and they're all pretty small yet. And she takes the one out and sets him down, gets him out of the car seat, she's going back and gets the other one out, and then the baby. That one there she put out first. That one scares me. Because, man, they can be gone like that, take off across the parking lot. And I'm thinking, man, you've got to watch them when that comes. I don't want them darting out in front of me. And they will. And the idea of holding the hands, and when they start start going to the store, and you know, she takes those hands and holding them because, because of what? Is it because she doesn't love them? Is it because it, she just doesn't want them to have any fun out in that parking lot with a great place to run? And I tell you what, between two and three, they get in a place like that, they just want to run. And they don't look ahead. No, it's absolutely because she loves them. That she's taking them by the hand and she's going to guide them through the danger. The park, parking lots can be a very dangerous place. They, they really can. And I, I don't know how many accidents happen in those, but accidents do happen, don't they? And uh, I see Brother, Brother Doug Cox, he's, he's a policeman, and he probably knows that there's some, some things happen in those parking lots. Be followers of God. God wants to take our hand. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to do that very thing. Not only redeem us, but then to guide us through His Word and the work of the Holy Spirit and to guide us into conformity to Him, to His own Son. To 
as his children. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and given us himself, given himself for us for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Two tremendous verses. And let's go to Philippians chapter 2. And, you know, if we had time to go back and look at this, this, these verses in the context that they're in, we would, but we'll start in verse 5 and that Jesus where they look at. But let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, which is also in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 5. Who being in the form of God, thought it not rather to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Here we have the creator of the universe, God the Son. And he takes upon himself the form of the creation of man. He takes that upon himself and he comes and puts himself in the care of a young Jewish girl to be raised in that family. And, and the virgin birth isn't the miracle. We usually talk about it in the theology book. It was the conception that was the miracle. It was a natural birth. It was the conception when he was conceived and he existed as the person of Jesus Christ from the time of his conception. And it's the same person. And we have to remember this. Jesus Christ did not come into existence at that time. Jesus Christ had always existed with the Father. Not as Jesus Christ the man. But as the Son of God. He existed in spirit just as the Father did. Because God is spirit. And he, at that time he took upon himself the form of man. And the glory that belonged to him. He did not divest himself. In fact that he became less than what he was or who he was. But he did set aside some of his privileges of exercise. When you read through the Gospels, and you'll see that Jesus Christ still owned all of those. He owned, he owned the, the, the waves and the wind, and they obeyed him when he wanted. Some get the wrong idea about where Christ came from, that he just, that's where he started. That. No, the person of Jesus Christ has always existed. He is as eternal as the Father. He is the Creator in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all three involved in that. Now I know it's hard to understand the Trinity because we are not in that realm. But that's a realm outside of what we can experience. Three persons, one God. It's not tritheism, as some people try to say, say that we believe. It's one God, three persons in the Godhead. Now I don't understand that, but I know that's what the Scriptures teach. Whether I understand it or not, it's not the issue. It's whether I can make it logically fit or think by na the natural world that I experience has nothing to do with it. It's what saith the Word of God. It will be vindicated. You know, it's had many challenges and distractions over the centuries, hasn't it? And the, the Bible has been vindicated. No, no error has ever been proven. As a matter of fact, as more evidence comes up, as the Bible is vindicated, the skeptics always have to move the ground and change it because certain things they don't even want to talk about anymore. You know, the skeptics in the late 1700s, early 1800s were saying, you know, the Bible's full of errors. There was no, no, no Assyrian kingdom, no city of Nineveh. They don't say that anymore. They don't bring that challenge up anymore. You get some old books, you can find that, those kind of things. They don't say there was no such thing as Hittite people anymore because they dug up and found whole libraries with a history of those people. And, and it goes on. Archaeology. The, the archaeology of Spade is the friend of the Bible when they take a look at those things truthfully. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought not Robert be equal with God, when Christ claimed to be God, he was not taking anything away from God. If a man claims to be God, he is robbing God of something that belongs exclusively to him. Exclusively to him. But when Jesus Christ claimed equality with God, he was not claiming anything that did not belong to him. He was not robbing 
anyone or anything other than. And then he says, but made himself of no reputation, took him in the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. He became as a servant. He came. Who did Christ come to serve? Well, he came to serve the Father. But who else did he come to serve? You and me. He came as our servant. He was doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He took upon himself the sins of the world when he went to Calvary and went to the cross. And he did it on your behalf, on my behalf, on behalf of the world. Yes, he was obedient to the Father. And it was the Father's desire to have a relationship with his creation that brought the Son into the world. And his life, his sinless life, has as much to do with your salvation, your sanctification, your redemption, as his work on the cross. It has every bit as much to do with it as his work on the cross. Without his sinless life, if Christ had not come into this world and lived the life he lived, his death on the cross would have been worthless on our behalf. The only one that he could have died for if he had not lived the life that he lived would have been himself. But he lived a sinless life. Perfect life. And he lived it out. You see, the Bible, yes, there's Israel and the dispensational distinction, and they are vitally important. And I stand as strong on that as anyone. And I think there's such important distinctions between Israel and the law and grace and, and the body of Christ. They're, they're very, very important. But at the same time, what was God doing with Israel? What's his purpose for Israel? If you go back and look at Israel, and you can find a lot of illustrations in there, that country. Israel is a picture of mankind. It's what it is. And you look at Israel's attitude toward God. That's a picture of mankind. God took the spotlight and shone on this one man, Abraham, and his family as an illustration for the world of their problem, of the rebellion against God. And that's what, you know, this all came together in, in the dispensation of the grace of God. When Israel rejected even the Son, and they rejected the Father and the Son and the, and the testimony of the Holy Spirit, and God set them aside, and they didn't set aside in unbelief. I, I mean, you know, dispensation of grace. It's just taking all the externals and stripped them off and given us what the basis for God's redemptive work is. That's what it's done. There's no man or woman that will be able to stand at the great white throne judgment and say, well, God, you know we couldn't do these things. We couldn't keep the law. If you'd only given us grace, we'd have done it. We'd have responded. Nobody will be able to say that. Humanity's proved otherwise. For the most part, the world is still in rebellion against the loving and gracious and holy God. Brother Fenton said last night, dead men walking, <laughs> and they don't even know they're dead. And I know I lived 36 years of my life that way. The Gospels record the, the, uh, the life of Christ, his life of humility and suffering that took him to the cross. Misunderstanding. That's probably one of the worst rejections we can have. Being misunderstood and rejected on that basis. And, and Christ underwent that all the time. You know? And that's very life. And he says here in, in Ephesians, we'll go back, we'll look at Philippians, we're still in Philippians. Verse 8, and being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. God not called you to prosperity. He may prosper you. He may not be long with, with 
was material wealth in and of itself. Money is not a problem. It's an attitude toward money that's a problem. That's what First Timothy said. It's the love of money that causes all kinds of, of trouble and evil and brings, and brings problems on the people. But we are called to give our lives as a sacrifice to Him. It says in Romans chapter 12 that it gives our bodies a living sacrifice. I want to point out something. You don't know why it says give your body a living sacrifice. For you to do that, your mind has to go first. If you haven't got the mindset, here I am, Lord, use me in whatever way, and I will accept that, and I will rejoice in it, and I'm going to thank you for it, whatever circumstance or situation I find myself in. Then you're going to find yourself thinking like the world with the world standards of what it means to get ahead and to be successful. And they're different. They're vastly different. They're completely different. They're totally different. God's ways are different. In, in Philippians, you carry that through. He says, but now God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. His life on earth was suffering. His reward was later. The body of Christ. Our life on earth is the servants for, of God. The glory comes later. And if you're seeking the glory of man, if you get it, that's all you're going to get from man. Because that's gone. Can we really say that we have the mind of Christ and we've been transformed if we're not willing to say, here I am, Lord, and you can use me however you please. It's up to you. Sometimes, I'm trying to think of the author's name, Painted Purpose, uh, a book that I first came aware of through Pastor Ware. Um, but it's a commentary on the book of Job. And Job's there for a purpose. It's not as obscure a book as many people think it is. And you get into it. Basically, it's Job complaining because God hadn't talked things over with him before he allowed things to happen to him. And Job was going through as bad a situation as, as you could go through. And he had his three friends that came and insisted Job was sinning. He insisted he wasn't. And then finally a fourth guy came. And he said, oh, you guys are wrong because you're not looking at God the character of God. Basically, is what he said. I read a commentary that had that so mixed up. But that's what he told them. And then God finally spoke. And he spoke to Job. And basically what he says, where were you when I created Matter of fact, where were you when I made you? And God's, pers I mean, God changed Job's perspective in that, through that. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Back to Ephesians chapter 5. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a suit and favor. Is our sacrifice, and yes, we do have something to offer to God, and all we have to offer to Him is our will. Surrender to Him and submit that to Him. You know, today, we see a great need in our world for the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of the grace of God. Sometimes you wonder, where, where are the, the preachers? I mean, I get, I get called and letters quite often. And the Brian Bible Society actually gets more than we do. Uh, do you have somebody that you can send us? And we need a pastor for our church. We, need a, we have a Bible study here. We can probably get started. I don't think it's because God's not calling men to the ministry. But I believe that he does. I believe that people aren't answering the call. Because in their mind, in their thinking, 
and the attitude that, that they have because their mind has not been renewed in every area is that the cost is too high. That there's a fear. I won't be able to make a living doing that. But I know those thoughts crossed my mind 29 years ago when I made the choice to quit my job and go to Bible school a few months after I was saved. It's an interesting thing that we think we can trust God for our eternity but we can't trust Him for tomorrow. And I'll tell you from personal experience, and my wife will back this up. We went through some times that it was like, whoa, what's going on here? This was 1981 when I quit my job. I was making $15 an hour at that time, and that's pretty good in 1981. And my wife was making five. And I quit and went to school. And so we went down to a $5 an hour income with $20 an hour bills. <laughs> um, I don't know what that would be equivalent to, but I was, a, I was an iron worker, a union iron worker, and they make around, I don't know what that scale is, up to $25, $26 an hour, or something like that, plus benefit. There was temptation to go back, to retreat, to back off. Is this really this important? It came to a place I had to make a decision. And I think of the song. I can't think of the name of it now, but uh, I decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I have not been sorry. I don't regret a minute of it. I don't regret the time that, you know, I went through Bible school eating tuna fish. It was the cheapest thing we could get at the time. I don't regret any of it. I rejoice in it because I look back and I can see how God has used that in my life, my wife's life. How we ended up here. That's interesting. But can we really say that we're following Paul as he followed Christ if we're not willing to actually die for the faith? What was Paul's final? His last one in the Testament was given in 2 Timothy. To Timothy. He said, all I have, Timothy. I'm in prison. I've been betrayed. Everybody's left me. You know what I'm going to give to you? I'm going to explain to you exactly how I got here so you can do it too. <laughs> this is my last will and testament. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, Timothy. That's what's going to happen. He says, and I'm leaving now. I'm going up. The Roman emperor just thought he had power over Paul. He didn't. Paul says, I finished the course. You know, I, I fought the fight. I finished the course. I finished the race. I'm going. And God has reserved for me a crown of righteousness. And not only for me, but also all who have loved His appearance. He says, that's where I'm going. Do we believe it? As the song says, the things of this world shall go strangely down in the light of His glory and grace. Verse 3, back to Ephesians 5, verse 3, that fornication and all in God and cleanness and covetousness, let not be one thing among you as become a saint. In other words, don't act like the world. What you're saved from is the penalty of sin, so quit sinning. 
you know, chapter 4, verses 17 through 23, it kind of says basically the same thing. Put off the old man, put it on the new. It's kind of going over it again, giving some more detail. It's not becoming, it's not a fit thing to do for a blood-bought saint to act like the world. It's not. And he points out some of the things that are that are that are manifest in the flesh that you can see won't see easier, you know, that we can look about and see. He says, you know, fornication, all uncleanness, not just some of it, or covetousness. Now this gets down into heart attitudes, doesn't it? Not just the open show. This gets down into the heart attitude. It gets down to the, to the nitty gritty of it. The things that come out in the open proceed from the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Verse 40, the filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, or not fitting, or not proper, but rather giving of thanks. rather giving of thanks. I want to go back to that. But, but this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person or covetous man or an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Again, basically talking about the what, what, what you know the, the, un, the unsaved they have nothing they have not you have everything in Christ you have nothing. It's interesting Paul never refers to believers as sinners. Even when they're sinning, he refers to the saints. Right. If you don't believe that, just read 1 Corinthians. Right. It's like there. He says here that they have no inheritance in God. You have an inheritance in Christ. So why are you trying to live out their inheritance? When you have an inheritance in Christ. Back then to verse 4. But rather giving of thanks. Does it show thankfulness for a saint when they act like the world, when they join the world, when they're involved in the world, if they have wrong attitudes and covetous attitudes, and that, that can go into a lot of different attitudes, hateful attitudes, belligerent, or just those secret things in the heart that, yeah, yeah, I'll get him. Or it cause us to make the same kind of decisions the world does. The little white lie doesn't really hurt. But you know what? Little lies need the big lie. Because it often needs to be covered up. Or how about how we handle the Word of God? Well, this really isn't that important. Therefore. Or these people are nice people. So, you know, we don't want to say this and offend them. And so you hold back on doctrine. And I'm speaking to pastors and Bible teachers. When a man compromises the word, he'll always go farther than he plans on. He will every time. You can't help it. It's that proverbial slippery slope. You are either going to go uphill and you're going to go under the power of the Holy Spirit and you're going to continue uphill or you're going to slide downhill. That's all you can do in your own power is go backwards. Give him thanks. I remember a young man that I, I spoke to years ago and he was uh, trying to defend the kind of music that he listened to. And he was really engrossed in it and it wasn't the rock music and thing. He was defending his, his music was... Uh, wasn't that same thing, and there were a lot of things in there that we had to find. And I said, okay, let's just sit down and listen to a couple. He said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. And next time I saw him, I said, well, you pick out the songs you want to listen to. And he, well, no, he didn't want to do that. He did not, when he went back and listened to him, he did not want to do that. Because he was listening to a kind of music that glorified drinking and divorce and running around and uh, on your spouses and those kind of things. You're filling your mind with those kind of thoughts. That's what you'll think. Your attitudes. 
It might not be open, but the underlying attitudes will be affected. The unrighteous have an inheritance. We have an inheritance of something. Verse 6. Do not let no man deceive you with vain words or empty talk. Because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone come along and take you in and tell you it really doesn't matter. That these things really aren't important. That what does it matter? You know, you do this and that. Well, everybody does it. It's a deception that plays down sin. And I know a lot of people, well, we in the great movement, we don't preach against sin. No, we don't preach against sin. We preach Christ. But you know what? Christ condemns sin. As a matter of fact, that's what it tells. In His death, He condemns sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. Besides that, Paul used a lot of ink writing about how the believer should live. And making a distinction between the two. That there's a world to shine and a Savior to embrace. And our thoughts and our attitudes and how we do things. And we need to be honest with ourselves. You know, the first person we have to be honest with. And the most important person that you have, I don't care whether you're, you're a minister or a housewife or a husband or what, what your occupation is or anything else, the first person you have a responsibility to carry God's Word to is you. You can't share what you don't have. And how do you do that? I believe there is a, a formula for getting to know the Word of God. Read it. It's just a one rule, one step. Read it. Pick it up and see what it says. And don't get caught up in the, the latest thing you find on the internet or here on the radio. Read it. And see what it really says. I think a lot of people don't understand the grace message. I, I think one of the reasons that we, the grace movement was more accepted back in, in the 40s and 50s and 60s is because more people had an understanding of their whole Bible. And there's a lot of people today that don't. And you have to start with. I, I realize sometimes when I'm trying to share the grace message with people, I'm so far over the head they have no idea what the Old Testament's about, except there's some stories in there about Abraham and David and so forth. They have no idea how they're connected or what they're or how they're connected with Jesus Christ. That there's a, not just a storyline, there's a genealogy. There's a history there. That's vitally important to understanding the Bible. And you can't understand the Bible without... You can't understand Paul completely. You can understand a lot about it. You can't understand Paul completely if you do not know the background of the Old Testament and what the law was and the purpose of it and what God was doing with Israel. It's just impossible. Don't be taken in by empty talk. The lost will be judged for what they do. Verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, those things that he was mentioning, cometh those things, come upon the, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We're children of love as a believer. The wrath of God is coming upon the children of disobedience. Matter of fact, Paul really hammers on that in this, in this book. He talks about it in chapter 2 also. He tells you, what were you? You were made alive. You want to walk after the course of this world and prince in the power of the air. That's where we were. We, we didn't deserve to be saved. Well, we might think, you know, we understand the word rightly divided, so, and we go to a grace assembly and we come to grace conferences, so maybe we deserve a little more grace than the Baptists. Presbyterian? Absolutely not. We don't deserve anything. None of us. 
not one son and daughter of Adam condemned apart from the blood of Christ condemned and the wrath of God comes upon the son of disobedience be not you therefore partakers with them and that's connected to verse 11 how much Pastor Seekin has to say about that? I'm about out of time anyway. I can't do too much damage. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Be not therefore partakers of them. Do you know, when you live like the world, you have an attitude like the world, and you encourage the world, you are putting a barrier between them and the cross. And in that sense, you're becoming an enemy of the cross. You think about it. Think about it. We're called to be different. I don't care how unpopular it is or how it may make you feel when people look at you and say, well, you're a different guy. I tell you what, after I was saved, And I had a reputation in the, the groups that I worked with. I was, I was a structural steel erection. And it's dangerous work. Sometimes dangerous men, literally. And I had a reputation there. And then pretty soon they get to realize, okay, and then the challenge comes. Sometimes you see if they can go to it. It was funny. If I was working alongside with one man by himself, you know, he, 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 his language would change. But if you went to chat at lunch, then it was almost like seeing a guy do each other because they're showing off for each other. They do pay attention and they do notice. A man that had a lot to do with my salvation. He never spoke a word to me about Jesus Christ. Never had the opportunity. But I saw his life change. I stopped in the bar one night on the way home. And Daryl wasn't there. And his buddy Richard was there. They, they worked at the Ford Motor Company in Lake Oma, Missouri. And they were stopped there in the bar, little bar in Lawson, Missouri, where I lived. And uh, where's Daryl? Daryl got religion on us. Daryl got religion on us. And we were talking about, I wonder how long it will be before he comes back. Daryl never did come back. But I was watching. I never told him that. I would never. And I saw him one day go into the bar. We were at what's called Lost and Picnic. They called it a festival here. He kept stopping. He got out of his car. And he went into the, into the bar. And I saw him. And I said, it made me mad. You know, I didn't know why. I didn't understand that. But it made me mad. He came, with me. he came right back out. He saw me. He came across the street. He said, I'm looking for my brother. Have you seen him? I've got to get hold of him. It's important. And I felt this flood of relief came over me. I would never have amended that. Anybody. Right. I didn't even understand it. Right. But I knew he had something. And when we don't demonstrate that, we are not making known the gospel of the grace of God. I had a man stand there one day. I, I swore. As a matter of fact, I was on a job down in Topeka, Kansas. We're putting the roof on the re-putting the roof after the tornado had come through and toward the was in the train yards. Huge building. And we we're just finishing up this one section. I sent the crew over to get started on the next section. They left me there with an apprentice and I was working with this man and they warned me about him. Watching me, the preacher, he gets you alone, he's gonna preach at you. <laughs> Well, I was ready for him. <laughs> Left me there with him, and we were stitching down the roof with metal roof, and, and something happened. I, I, I used the name of the Lord. A swear word, people do. And he just looked at me and he said, You know, he says, You've got the right name, but you're using it wrong. I said, What are you talking about? I had no idea what I, you know, you don't even realize what you said. And he said, No, the name is Jesus Christ. He said, You're calling on the right name, and you're using it wrong. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I'd like to tell you about Jesus Christ. And I said, 
No, I was trying. I've been warned. And I told him, no, I don't need to hear anything about your religion or your, your Jesus Christ. I know all about him that I need to know. And that man, old man, he's probably about 40. <laughs> Remember, I was an apprentice. I was like 20. And uh, you never think about living that long at that age. Um, he just stood there and looked at me. He had dark glasses on. That's been the sun. That's galvanized brook. He just looked at me. It seemed like a long time. And I was expecting for him to argue with me or something, you know. And, and uh, I was ready to put him down. And he just stood there. Tears. Down from behind the glass. And rolled down his cheeks. And a rough, tough iron worker. He stood there and he said, and he said, well, you don't know the Jesus Christ I'm talking about. He wouldn't talk about him like that. He turned around and walked away. Probably the most powerful thing that he could have done. Thirteen years later, when I finally came to know the Lord as my Savior, I still hadn't shaken that, that view, that man's face. It would come back into my mind at times and I couldn't understand it. He was standing there he was not ashamed to cry. He had concern over my soul. He had as powerful a testimony as the preacher that was preaching when I heard the message and I just finally understood grace and acceptance. Him and Daryl both did. When we live like the world, you nullify that. You take it away. That testimony is gone. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the goodness of your grace, your love and mercy, and for all that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us always be aware of that. And the importance of our testimony, importance to you, and how our testimony is a, is a way to thank you and praise you. And also to reach out to a lost world. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ.